Well, I'm excited to be with you here, uh, continuing in the book of James, talking about focusing on faith. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at Coastal, and uh, privileged to be here to share this message. So before we jump in, let me just say a quick prayer, and then we'll go right in. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the power that it has to transform a life. And just like Pastor Brad said earlier, we don't want to just be hearers of it. We want to be doers of it. We want to see its effect in our life. And we know that that comes from you, Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Wherever people are watching from today, whatever time zone it is, whatever format, whatever platform they're using, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come into that space and teach us, equip us, help us to be like Christ, like you promised you would. And Holy Spirit, help me to speak. Speak through my mouth, think through my mind, let it be none of me and all of you. And God, I thank you that you promised that signs and wonders will follow the preaching of your word. We believe it, we receive it. In Jesus' name, everybody from all over the place said amen and amen. Well, today I want to talk about faith in action. Faith in action. As we've been going through this series in the book of James... Time and time again, Old and New Testament, you see faith. It's everywhere. We're saved by faith. We live by faith. Uh, This is the, the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. In fact, it says that when Jesus returns, and he is coming back, he's looking for one specific thing according to Luke chapter 18, verse 8. He's looking for faith. Faith is so powerful. Faith is so crucial in the, in the life of a believer. In fact, the Bible doesn't call us Christians. Did you know that? Are you sure? Yeah. It says in, Antioch, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, that it was in Antioch that we were first called Christians. Christian basically means little Christ. But the Bible calls you and I believers. Believers. Why? Because that's what we do. We are created, we are designed, we're engineered to believe. What do we believe? We believe in a good God. Oh, we believe in a, in a great God. We believe in a God that saves, a God that heals, a God that delivers, a God that sets free. Last weekend, I was so blessed. Just a shout out to our prayer team um, on, on our website, our, our prayer team on, um, on Church Online. Um, there was this, this woman who had been asking for prayer for over a year for her marriage. And last week, we just, she just shared with us that there's breakthrough in their marriage. We believe in a God that restores marriages, don't you? We believe. That's what we do. We are believers. Oh, come on. Say it with me. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. We believe in a God who is amazing. Now, Satan knows this. And we're going to see in just a moment that demons actually have faith. We'll talk about about that in just a second. Satan understands that the Bible is true when it says that all things are possible to those that talk about their faith. No. To those that sing about their faith. The Bible says all things are possible to those that believe. And believe is not a noun, it's a verb. It's an action word. Belief has works. All things are possible to those that believe. Satan understands that the moment you begin to recognize and understand how to use this amazing gift called faith and begin stepping out and operating it and working it out, he knows you are a threat to him. And so he'll do whatever he can to stop you from understanding what faith is, but what faith does. What faith does. So that's what we're going to be talking about today in the book of James, because that's what James is about to share with us today. today. How to put our faith in action. So let's jump in with point number one in your notes. Point number one, we are saved for a work, not by a work. In James chapter 2, verse 14 and 17, The Bible says this, what does it profit, my brothers or sisters, if someone said, by the way, when it says my brothers, that's in the original language, it's it's talking about both. It's not not a gender term. It's talking about brothers and sisters, about, about all of us. My brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, watch this, can faith save him? Now, this is a rhetorical question, but the answer he's inferring is no. 
If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, you can go to the next, and one of you says to them, depart, be in peace. Well, that sounds pretty nice, pretty spiritual. Be warm. Oh, you're hungry? Be filled in Jesus' name. <laughs> can that faith save them? If you don't give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? It's just a slap in the face. Hey, I'm praying for you. Have you ever met somebody or talked to somebody and have said, oh, that's so sad, I'll pray for you. And you know they're not going to pray for you. They're not going to think about you. You're out of their mind the moment they walk away. You can tell. That's also faith by itself. If it does not have what? Works. Is dead. Now, right off the bat here, James is talking about the difference between a dead faith and a dynamic faith. A dead faith, a faith that does, that, that, that's just inoperative, no works, and a dynamic faith, a faith that works, a faith that brings in miracles, a faith that is shown by what it does. That's the difference. And notice what he says here. You can't tell the difference just by what it sounds like. Let me give you a prime example. Right here, I have two bowls of apples. Delicious looking red apples. Now, they all look good. But did you know that one of these bowls is actually fake? Not the bowl is fake, but the apples are in the bowl are fake. But do you know which one? Is it, and I have here, we put A and B. So in the chat, in Facebook, YouTube, Church Online, um, if you're watching uh, on TV, on TELUS, and you can talk to somebody else, interact with somebody else in your room, but which one of these is fake? Is it A or B? Because just by looking at it, you can't tell. Now, I'll tell you what it is in just a moment. But what I mean by this is, just like you can't tell what's real and what's not by looking at it, you can't tell what is what is dynamic faith and dead faith by just hearing it? It begs action. It begs works. This is so important that we realize this, church, because there's so much misconception out there. So many people who have trusted the wrong person, given to the wrong person, done this with the right, entered into a relationship with the wrong person. Singles, let me encourage you with this. Don't just look for the look. Look for the fruit. Don't just look for the appearance. Look for the actions. Don't just look for the words. Look for the works. Come on. People have been hurt with this. How many times have you prayed with people and said, they said they were a Christian, so I married them. They said they were a Christian, so I hired them. They said they were a Christian, so I partnered with them. But we can fall in love with professing and not practicing. If we're not careful, we can, so we can fall in love with words and not works. And that's what the difference between dynamic and dynamic faith and dead faith is. Because dead faith is constantly talking, talking, talking. It's professing, professing, professing. You know, we just had the Oscars last week. If case, any, you know, I was saying earlier, I didn't even realize the Academy Awards were on. It, it just kind of came and went, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot happening in our world, so it's something that was completely missed. Not that I watch, I watch it anyway, but um, it, w what we do with the Academy Awards, with, with, with other award shows, we are giving awards to people who acted. And the Bible actually talks about actors as well, except in the Bible, Jesus calls them hypocrites. And hypocrite's the word that was used many times for acting back in those days. But Jesus was talking about a, a group of people who had words, but no works. Talk, but no actions. And he called them. He said, don't do what they do. Do what they say. And, and I think in our world, we can profess love, but are we loving Come on, Christians. This is one of the things the world has against many believers is that they say they're hypocrites. They do one thing. But as believers, let's make decisions to not just profess love, but we love. We don't just profess giving. We give. We don't just profess kindness. We, we're kind. We don't just profess forgiveness. We forgive. That's what we do. We are Christians. We don't just profess. We practice. 
married people. I taught to singles, now I'm talking to married people. Let's make sure we don't just profess romance. We practice romance. Pastor Dave often says, the way you, the way you won them is the way you keep them. <laughs> Is by practicing. You know, 10 years ago to this, 10 years ago today, well, I think within the last week or so, 10 years ago, um, I asked my wife to marry me. And, you know, before I ever met Christy, before I met Christy, I was not very much a romantic guy. I didn't much care. I didn't care about, like, you know, romance movies, all these different things. I didn't much care about that. But when I met my wife, Christy, man, it's just like I would do anything for her. And I remember when I was planning to marry her, man, I put so much emphasis and work into it. I got a team of people to come help me. And, you know, we staged this beach, in uh, this lake beach in, in, in Winnipeg. And I wrote, like, I wrote poems for her and stapled them um, on, on these trees with roses and, and, um, and, and just led them to this was beautiful clearing that I made and Right on top of the hill, it was a beautiful picnic, and we even had fireworks. It was an amazing, amazing night. But that was 10 years ago. <laughs> now, we're about to celebrate a 10-year anniversary in October. And what if I came home on October 14th, which is our anniversary, and I had a, maybe a bag of take, uh, um, a box of takeout and kind of plopped it on the table and sat down with her on a 10-year anniversary and said to her, Honey, do you remember the beautiful poems I wrote you? 10 years ago. Do you remember the beautiful words I showered you with, the fireworks, the ring I gave you 10 years ago? Is that a dead romance or a dynamic romance? <laughs> Don't answer that. I already know. <laughs> She'd be like, what are you doing for me right now? What are you doing right now? Don't just profess romance. Practice romance. The way you win them is the way you keep them. And that's the same way when it comes to faith. All right. Have you figured it out? Is it A or B? I heard in the, one of the, in the last service, there was a lot of A's, not enough B's, because B is the correct answer. This is the real fruit. And big shout out to Julie who helped me. She tricked you guys. She put stickers in both. Did you see that? Some of you guys guessed A because you saw the sticker. <laughs> Amen. Come on, Christians. Come on, believers. We don't profess. We don't just profess. We practice. Now, for the rest of the message, I want to talk about what dynamic faith looks like. But before I do that, I, I do want to clear up and just maybe clarify some of the things that James is saying here. Because there, it says here we're saved for a work, but not by a work. And there are countless believers around, or countless people around the world, perhaps even watching right now. You may be watching for the first time. By the way, welcome to Coastal Church. Say, thank you for visiting us. We're glad that you are here. And you may be watching and you may be thinking that you don't qualify to be accepted by God that you don't qualify, you, you're unworthy to be accepted by God. And you feel like, well, you know, if I, if I do enough, if I, if I watch enough messages, if I give enough, if I serve enough, if, if, I do, if I do, 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 then I'll finally qualify to be accepted by God. Just so you know, that's not what James is talking about here. Because Pastor James, who was here before I did, he just, he, he laid it out so clearly God loves you unconditionally. There is nothing you can do to earn God's love. And there's nothing that you can do that God would push you away. God loves you unconditionally. His love to you is irregardless of your works. It's not works that save you. We're not saved by works, but we are saved for a work. And so Paul, years later, would come and he'd write the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and, uh, book of Ephesians, and in chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, this is what he would say. For it is by grace you have been saved. Not by works. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is what? The gift of God. Lest anyone should boast. So Paul here is talking not about the application of faith, but about the means of faith. See, Paul was writing to a legalistic culture that demanded works. You got to do this, 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 or else God's, God's not going to accept you. James was talking about the application of faith. He was writing to a group of believers who were apathetic about their faith. It, it, apathy had settled in. They weren't doing anything with it. And he said, no, you, your, if you want to make a difference in the world, if you want people to come to know Jesus, your faith has got to have works. So I, I just want to encourage you. If you, you who are watching right now, God loves you. Yeah. 
just the way you are. But he doesn't allow you, in his love, he doesn't allow you to stay the same. Because if you accept him in your heart, man, he begins to do a phenomenal work on the inside of you. He begins to do a phenomenal thing. He begins to make you like Christ. You can forgive like Jesus, love like Jesus, embrace, love the world. The Holy Spirit begins to do that, transforming you. The rest of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, verse 10 says this, For we are God's own handiwork. The word handiwork means poem. It's a beautiful word that means it's design. You're God's design. Created in Christ just to do good works, which God prepared before you. Oh, really become like Jesus? Me? Absolutely. Are you sure? Yes. You mean really blow your mind? Jesus said that you shall do greater works. Now I'm just messing with you. <laughs> did he say that? Yes, he did. Oh man, if you just knew the power on the inside of you. So when we talk about dynamic faith, it's not just you that works it out. The Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit is in you to do it through you. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let's go to point number two. Point number two, faith and works are inseparable. James chapter 2, verse 18 and 20, he continues by saying this. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, faith and works are inseparable. You believe that there is one God. You do well. <laughs> the easy to read translation says, you believe there's one God, good for you. Another translation says, you believe that there's one God, big deal. <laughs> Why? Because even the demons believe and tremble. You know that there is a demon faith? A demon faith, a deceived faith. Demons believe that there is God. There is a God. But they're not making their action make a difference in their life. <laughs> Next part says, but do you want to know, oh foolish man, that without faith, or that faith without works is, is what? Dead. See, action is not the reason for our faith, but the demonstration of it. Our faith should have action. Remember, to believe is a verb. Ooh, and let me just say this. This is so good. When you step out in faith, that is where you meet the power of God. Faith and works are inseparable. you got to keep them together. And it's when you believe and you add works that, boom, the power of God comes to work in your life. And you get the breakthrough that you're believing for. I know of no greater example in the Bible than the woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. And she's a perfect example of how she put, she put faith and works together. Let me just, let's talk about this story for just a moment. The Bible says, and there was a woman, Mark chapter 5, verse 25, there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Now, that disease itself, the customs of the land at that time said, you cannot go in public. You were barred from going in public. It was illegal. You could have been stoned, killed for that. So she had a discharge of blood. So she lived a life of isolation, ostracized by everybody she knew. She heard the reports. She heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garments. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Now, let's just break this down for a little bit. She heard the reports, but she didn't stop there. She spoke. She said. Now, she heard and said, heard and said. Up until this point, her faith has made no difference. She's believed. That's a, big, that's a huge starting, starting place. She's professed. But it's not dynamic until what did she do here? She came up behind Jesus and touched his garments. She put works to her faith. And the Bible says at that hour, boom, she was healed. The power of God went on the inside of her and made a difference in her life because she believed and she stepped out. Let me just tell you this, church. Faith is not just believing despite the circumstances. Faith is acting despite the consequences. This was a risk for her to step out. She was taking her own life in danger. Have you ever done anything risky? And in the chat, let us know, what's the riskiest thing that you have done? For this woman, it was stepping out. And the Bible says at the moment, her, her faith, as long as she said and spoke something, the power was still there, but it had not connected. It was at that moment when she stepped out. She 
put faith and works together and the power of God came in because faith is not just believing despite the circumstances. Faith is believing, faith is acting despite the consequences. Let me give you a good example of this. Right now, in this room, there's power. Okay, there's electricity coming into this room. We, we have lights, we have cameras, we have sound. There's power going into this room. And that power is regulated by a breaker. I think we have a picture of a breaker. I couldn't bring a breaker on stage. But we have a picture of it. Um, and this breaker is turned on. Therefore, power is surging into this room. But that power is still controlled by a tiny thing called the light switch. Because if the light switch is off, power could be coming in, but it'd still be dark. For example, let's just put that breaker up on there. The breaker right now is on, but the breaker could be on and it could still be dark in this room. Now, when I turn the switch on or switch off, it's dark. And you can tell I'm just a silhouette as you can see on there. <laughs> The breaker's on, but it's still dark. Power's flowing, but it's still dark. There's electricity available in this room, but it's still dark until I make a decision to turn a switch on and lights come on. What am I saying here? The breaker is God's power. The breaker is God's power. God has turned the breaker on. Power is flowing. His grace is available for you. His grace for finances, for faith, for family, for career. His grace is available for you. It's there for you. But you have a decision. You have to step out in faith for it to make a difference in your life. You have to mix your faith and works together. Let me turn the light off for just a moment here and just talk about this a little bit further. Breakers on. Power is available, but it's still dark. Now, I can cry for power. Oh, where's the power? There's no power here. Why, isn't it? Why God aren't you doing anything? You can beg for power. You can sing for the power. You can do all those things. You can even believe in the power. But none of it make a difference until you turn the light on. Until you step out. Oh, I know God's calling you, some of you guys to step out. To step out and believe God for big things in your life. Again, you're believing for finances. You're believing for provision. You're believing for a breakthrough in different parts of your life. Step out. Turn the light switch on. Send that resume. Make that phone call. Forgive that person. Make, start that conversation. Ask her out. So that's something. That's for somebody right there. Somebody's like, amen to that. <laughs> all the singles, I can hear all the singles from all the platforms. Yes, ask me out. Step out and watch the power of God flow into that situation. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let's go to point, <laughs> point number three. I heard a lot of loud amens of that. Point number three. Works give faith its full expression. This is our final point tonight, and I just want to kind of bring it to a close here because we just talked about what dynamic faith looks like. Let me show you what, it, what happens. Or I just showed you what happens when you step out or what, what it looks like. Let me show you a bit more on a practical level what you can do. In, in, in uh, James chapter 2, verse 22 to 25, this is what the Bible says. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Now, whose faith is it talking about? It's talking about Abraham. Next verse says, and the scriptures was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Pastor James talked about last week's message. I want to just plug it again. It was so good. And it's talking about that God has no favor. God doesn't show favoritism. He shows favor, but he doesn't show it by favoritism. He's no respecter of persons. 
And James is continuing this because he's talking about two people who are polar opposites in terms of where they came from, who they were. You're talking about Abraham, a man respected, revered, a father of faith, a patriarch. And then he talked about Rahab. Rahab was a harlot. The Bible talks about she was a prostitute. So James is bringing to the forefront a patriarch and a prostitute. And he's about to show you that it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done. God respects faith. And when you step out, regardless of your past, God will honor that faith. So what do we learn from Abraham? We learn that a faith that works steps out. A faith that works steps out. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 12 says of Abraham, by faith Abraham, when he called, when he, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, what did he do? He obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. God had given him a dream. Your descendants will be as the sands of, this, of the ground <laughs> and the stars in the sky. God gave him a dream. God may have given you a dream. But every dream requires a step. Notice I didn't say a leap. I said a step. If you got, you know, we love to talk about leaps of faith. Hollywood, Disney, we love to talk about leaps. Just take that leap of faith. Just, just do it. Take that leap. That's not the Bible. The Bible doesn't talk about a leap of faith. It talks about a step of faith. The Bible is a lot more practical than you think. It talks about a step of faith. Every dream requires a step. And Abraham had a dream, a big dream, an impossible dream, to have children when he was so old and his wife was also so old and barren. But God says, here is the key to your impossible dream. Take a step. It may not make sense. It may seem weird. Take a step. Leave everything you have, um, Abraham. Leave everything you've ever known and step out. Where am I going, God? Just step out. I don't know where I'm going. Just take a step. God wants you to take a step. He's leading you to do something. He's given you the dream. Now he's given you the step. It may seem backwards. It may seem like he's pulling you back. It may seem like it's not connected. But every dream has a step. And remember, when you take a step, you meet the power of God. I love what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said this, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. Martin Luther King, was this, this dude was amazing. We know him as this amazing civil rights figure. We know him, we see him leading the march with thousands of people around him, making that, ma making that speech, one of the most famous speeches in history, when he said, I have a dream. But before he could see his dream come to fruition, God said, take a step. And you know what MLK's step was? He made a decision that I am going to love those who hate me. He, that was a step that he took in his heart. I refuse to use violent means to, to bring about equality. I'm going to love those who hate me. Because hate, he said, hate doesn't drive out hate. Love drives out hate. And that became his step. And you know that just by taking a simple step, God began to open doors. He was a preacher. God began to lead him in different places until he became what he is. Before he ever said, I had a dream. He had to take that step. Take a step. I think of Jenny Konkin. Jenny, I think, I believe Veterans Manor, Holy House, they're watching right now. Jenny is amazing, this amazing person. She had a dream to touch, to transform the downtown east side here in Vancouver. And one of the things that she saw, she saw there was loneliness that was there. And she had this big dream in her heart, big dream in her mind. And she said, well, you know what? I see loneliness. I'm going to start by starting a family meal. And in, in an SRO that she owns, that she, her family owned, Avalon, she began to start a family meal for veterans, seniors, people who are, this, who are um, cast aside, people who are overlooked. And she said, you know, I'm going to just start a family dinner. And that was the step that she took. Did you know that to date, since the pandemic, since the pandemic started to now, so it's been hardly a year, she has served 200 thousand meals to people in the downtown east side in 19 buildings in the downtown east side it didn't start off that way 
It started off with a family. That was her step, a family dinner. And I just, they're watching right now. Big shout out. I'm, I'm privileged to be part of the board of, of Holy House. They're phenomenal, great place to serve. By the way, she had a dream. Abram had a dream. MLK had a dream. But God said, take a step. What's your step? What's your step? We learned that from Abraham. From Rahab, we learn that faith speaks out. Faith speaks out. By the way, again, check out Pastor Karen's blog about Rahab. It'll go more into detail than, about what, than what I'm about to say right here. But you got to remember Rahab, as we mentioned before, not only was she a woman, back then women were really disparaged and trodden down and, and discrimi- uh, discriminated against. It is said that even if you're a woman at that time, you couldn't even testify in a court of law. It was a backwards culture back then. And so it, by all accounts, she should have been disqualified from doing, ever doing anything great for God. Not only that, but she was a prostitute. She, was, she carried scandal everywhere she went, ostracized, ostracized, isolated. But she had faith. And when those spies came into Jericho, she gave them room. The Israeli spies came into Jericho at that time. She got, she hid them. You can read the story in Joshua chapter 2. Go back and read that story. And she decided to save, to hide the Israeli spies, but she spoke out. And this is what she said in Joshua chapter 2, verse 9, really quickly. She said this, I know the Lord has given you this land. We are all afraid of you. She recognized a God. She, didn't, she was a Canaanite woman. She was from Jericho. She wasn't even Jewish. But she recognized God in her limited faith. She decided to speak out. And she said, come with me. And she gave them lodging, taking her whole life in in danger. She spoke out. You don't need a lot of faith. You don't need a lot of faith. She had limited faith, but she was able to speak out. And her life is this amazing monument. Not only only did she change the course of a nation, not only that, but she's also in the genealogy of Jesus. She's mentioned as a woman, as a prophet, mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus because she spoke out. What will happen when you speak out? Don't be afraid of your faith. Don't be afraid to stand out. Don't be afraid to say, this is enough. Don't be afraid to say, I believe in Jesus. Don't be afraid to share this message on your socials. Don't be afraid to invite somebody to church. Speak out. And watch what God does. Church, I want to encourage you. God is wanting you to speak out. Let me just tell you this. Thousands of years later, a team, uh, an excavation team would be on site where Jericho used to be. And if you remember the Bible, the walls of Jericho fell down. And this team went on the site and they uncovered the fallen walls of Jericho, the ruined city of Jericho. But they realized something that was strange. All the walls were down, but there was one wall that was still standing. I have a picture of it here. Still standing. The only section of the wall still standing. And they believe this is where Rahab lived. Thousands of years, her faith still stands out because she spoke out. Don't be afraid to speak out. And the last point of faith that works, works out. Church family, I want to pray with you right now. You may be here and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity. All it takes is surrender. But Pastor Chris, what do I have to do? No, no, no. It's not what you do. This is solely by faith. But when you speak out these words, pray these words out loud, a miracle takes place in your heart. And the Holy Spirit, God, lives on the inside of you. And He begins to change you. All it takes is surrender. You've done life on your own for so long. And you may be a Rahab. You may have a a scandalous life. God wants you. Oh, He wants you. So I want to encourage you. I want to invite you to say this prayer. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. I believe he died. I believe he was raised from the dead that I may have life. Take my life and do something with it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.